Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's Thursday afternoon uh, webinar, or part of ATARC's Thursday after lunch webinar series. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jonathan Albaum, and I am the principal digital strategist for the federal government at ServiceNow. I'm taking over for Tom Suter today, and I'm going to be moderating this fireside chat. Uh, today, we're going to cover a framework for dealing with a crisis like we're all dealing with now uh, during the pandemic. Our federal CIO panelists will go in depth about the changes and the innovations they've had to incorporate into their agency and how they plan to uh, make these changes part of their ongoing operations moving forward. So I want to welcome everybody to uh, to today's session. Um, I want to thank the entire ATARC team. I want to thank uh, Connie Coleman uh, from ServiceNow and the entire ServiceNow team for sponsoring today's event. So this afternoon, we're going to hear from uh, two um, well-established CIOs. Uh, we're going to hear from Jason Gray, who is a CIO for the Department of Education. And we're going to hear from Mark Patterson, who is the Chief Information Officer at the Department of Defense Education Activity. It's part of DOD. So I'd like to begin by um, asking uh, Jason and Mark to introduce themselves and provide a little bit of background on their careers their, and their organizations. So we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll start with Mark. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Patterson, as mentioned. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Department of Defense Education Activity. Um, if you're familiar with us, you probably know us as DODEA or DODEA. Um, we like to use those acronyms, or previously we would have been called DODS or DDES. Um, we operate right now 160 schools in eight districts located in 11 countries, seven states, and two territories across 10 time zones. Um, that's a lot. Uh, it, it is. Uh, it's a very exciting mission. Um, to summarize it, what we do is we're the K through 12 school district for military connected children. There are about uh, 990,000 military connected children around the world. Uh, within DODEA, we support about 70,000, which is around 7%. Um, we also have a workforce of about 12,500. Again, spread around the world, about 8,000 of those are, are teachers and administrators. Um, wide, worldwide, um, great mission, uh, love the kids, support the kids, and a huge .edu network that we support to keep those schools up and operating. Um, again, as, as mentioned previously, this has been a challenging time. I think we'll talk more in depth in a little bit about some of the challenges we faced and some of the things that we put in place or will be putting in place very quickly to adapt um, to this uh, evolving environment that, that we're in. Um, that's all I have, Jonathan. Pretty quick and easy. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jason, uh, why don't you go ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself, a little bit of background on who you are and um, Department of Education. Great. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for having me. Um, I, I am well aware of the DODEA comment, uh, started my career in the DOD. Uh, so this is the, the fifth agency I've actually been at, uh, being at education uh, for now a little over four years uh, as their CIO. Um, we have a, around a little over $800 million from an IT portfolio standpoint of systems uh, and services that we provide, which is the full spectrum. Uh, you know, nationwide, we've got, you know, IT operations, governance, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, when, I, when I got to the department, I know we're here to talk about resilience, but when I, when I got to the department, my focus was really uh, on five key focus areas. Uh, number one was cybersecurity, which is absolutely critical and continues to be. Uh, number two was governance, which is kind of how does everything work and, and how do you oversee it and make sure that you're uh, spending taxpaying dollars appropriately. Uh, number three, which has been absolutely critical, and I plan on talking a little bit about this today, uh, is IT modernization. Uh, number four uh, is uh, user experience, because it's absolutely critical. Uh, and number five, uh, organizational health, because if you don't have a healthy organization, uh, the people actually deliver all the services that everyone depends on uh, doesn't go very well. So uh, it's been a great experience in education. Uh, I love working for government. Uh, I love the mission uh, of education. 
uh, I think it's great that uh, that Mark and I's mission align very very well. I'm not sure if that was orchestrated correctly, but that's beautiful. Uh, so looking forward to the conversation. And uh, thanks, Jason. And you know what a perfect um, you know set of CIOs to have as people are preparing to go back to school, right? Think about education, and children, and you know it's just an example of how we've all had to sort of reframe our thinking about um just about everything including how we uh, educate our children to how we run our organizations how we interact with our customers so um, i want to thank uh, mark and jason for kicking things off i'm gonna go ahead and share a couple of slides that will help frame out some of the questions that we're going to focus on so let me go ahead and and, and do that um, so the uh the concept of this uh, new normal and a roadmap to the new normal a lot of people are talking about uh, when um, you know this this happened at ServiceNow, we we all sort of defaulted back to uh, some experience we had previously, and you know the immediate um, ex, uh, experience was one of responding to the crisis at hand. And as we uh, as we get into the conversation, you know, I really want Jason to be able to be able to talk about how his organization responded because I think they did it extremely well. But that was the that was the mode we were all in for the first you know five, four or five weeks for many organizations, just figuring out how to support this, you know, remote work and support the mission in a, in a remote way. Um, what we're, we do want to focus on uh, a little bit more today, though, is how do you take all those changes and embed them in your organization so you're ready as you move forward? And whatever the next crisis is, uh, if it's a continuation of the pandemic, if it's an earthquake, if it is a, it's a flood, it is some other a catastrophic event, you're ready. And um, the the ability to maintain productivity in time of crisis is there, irrespective of your of your organization and how you do your work. And then lastly, is this longer term idea of, you know, real resiliency. I like to think about it as a as, you know, true digital transformation. You get to the point where the organization can operate um, really no matter what's happening. You've automated the parts that can be automated. You rely less on humans to do certain tasks. Uh, there's more AI, there's more um, connectivity across uh, systems and you know across agencies and across people so that that's where i think you know this this whole thing is going and um this is a you know a, a frame for some of the talk that we're going to have today you know and one of the um concepts that i think supports this is this idea of uh, a platform uh you know we talk about platform as a service often um i think it's a strategy that you know, a lot of organizations are adopting in order to be better prepared. You know, and st platform strategies support this idea of end-to-end -end workflows, and you know, empowering um, people to either create workflows or move data around to get their work done more efficiently. Core is data integration. Uh, experiences really matter, I think, in a time like this when there's a lot of uncertainty, and the ability to collaborate has you know, change uh, for people in this environment because we don't have the same opportunity to interact that we, that we used to. So bringing that online is, is clearly important. And, um, you know, long-term it's about flexibility, uh, interoperability, um, being able to see into your processes and your organization to understand how, how work is going. So it's a, it's a strategy built around platforms, I think is, is making a difference in some of the organizations I see. And you know, very quickly from a ServiceNow perspective, um, you know, we we talk about platforms all the time. ServiceNow is a platform company. We um, we uh, built a very robust platform. We we refer to it as the Now platform, and everything that you know about ServiceNow is sort of baked into that platform. The the, the configuration management database, uh, integration capabilities, uh, developer tools, mobile components, and you know, it's on top of that platform that uh, the the IT workflows uh, that you know uh, IT service management or IT operations or employee workflows for onboarding offboarding or customer service workflows or the ability to build custom workflows through uh, through the app engine all of those things ride on the now platform which is a platform uh, for workflow and it they, the core to it really uh, is the integration with with data system with data in a variety of systems whether they are um, systems that are, you know, quote unquote legacy or they're newer systems is the core data that an agency uh, needs. So the integration of that data, leveraging that data via workflow to drive mission outcomes is really, I think, one of the, you know, calling cards for uh, a platform company like ServiceNow. And uh, ServiceNow 
likes to think of ourselves as the platform of the platforms. You know, we can connect the data in very meaningful ways and allow people to interact with it through the, the tools that they are most comfortable with, web tools, uh, chat tools, uh, mobile devices. Um, and you know that that's part of important part of the ServiceNow story, that ability to connect the, the disconnected aspects of an operation. And that's become increasingly important in today's uh, in today's age. Uh, the unstructured collaboration we relied on in the past doesn't necessarily work so well any longer. So as we as we think about today's uh, questions, whether it's a, whether it's platforms or it's the integration of data, it's the integration of systems, I think a lot of uh, what we'll hear about is uh, increased collaboration and the ability to drive uh, mission outcomes by working together in, in different ways. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause there and we're going to, I want to jump into a couple of questions. And um, this one I want to lead off with Jason. And Jason, if I can ask you, can you talk a little bit about your modern, modernization journey at the Department of Education and how it really set you up for um, that, that response phase that we talked about in, in, the, in the beginning of these slides? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I and I love your uh, your slide deck and talking about the importance of uh, the, the platform, because uh, coming into a new organization, you know, the first thing you want to understand, and this is something you learn many, many years ago is what am I responsible for? You want to do an inventory, you want to have an understanding of all of the things that you're responsible for. Um, which is, you know, ideally, you have that it's all in a nice little CMDB and um, ideally. Um, but what we did is we started doing an assessment shortly after getting to the department uh, and focused on creating a, a visualization of our, our as is um, environment. And the, the focus was on connecting a lot of those dots. And, and again, I, I mentioned the five focus areas. It was cybersecurity, what do I have? Governance, what do I have? IT modernization, what do I have? Uh, and, and from there, which literally took a few months, <laughs> to get that done, uh, we thought, okay, well, let's talk about some of the things we want to achieve uh, going forward. And, and we focused on three real key things. When, when I saw the as is environment, it was focused on, um, you know, we, we had a lot of cloud. Uh, fortunately at the Department of Education, we're 100% cloud. Uh, and so while a lot of government is focused on data center optimization, consolidation, uh, at the Department of Education, we're focused on cloud consolidation uh, and optimization. Uh, because we had a lot of cloud. And, and so that was one of the key areas. Uh, we also looked at rationalization uh, from an application system standpoint, because we realized through the assessment that we had uh, some duplicative services that we were paying for and, and dependent on, and we looked at ways to consolidate them. And the third key area was automation. How can we automate some of these systems with manual process? So, so, so we looked at the as is, uh, then we created a 2B and then a roadmap to actually get there. Uh, and I will say that uh, our IT modernization journey literally kicked off uh, last year. Um, the contracts were awarded. We made our final transition in May of last year uh, and it could not have come at a more perfect time uh, because in the past environment, we were working with systems that were really slow, uh, where now the impact of the pandemic at the department has been rather insignificant. So timing is everything in, in life and information technology, right? Um, Jason, when, uh, when you started down that uh, technology modernization, um, how, what kind of uh, leadership support did you get? And how, how did you make it relevant to uh, the mission of the Department of Education? So that's a great question, uh, and I definitely uh, would attribute a large part of the success to the support that we have had. Uh, a large part of my career has been working in healthcare IT, although as time goes on, it's getting less and less. Uh, but in healthcare, you, you need an emergency room. Uh, and from my experience, a, a lot of IT organizations tend to run like an emergency room. But to your point, when you talk about resiliency, it's about creating the, uh, the more tactical and strategic decisions of which um, IT modernization is one of them. So it was really about communicating what we're doing and why we're doing it and the impact of what we're doing uh, as it related. So to give you an example, on day two when I got to the department, uh, I was given this, this long, uh, during an all staff or an all hands meeting, someone had shared that, do you know how much time we waste waiting for our machines to boot up? 
what was fascinating is on day three, I was like, wow, what did I get myself into? Uh, but um, that was a key anchor point of, listen, I know that I can make this faster. And we went from a, a, around a 20 minute boot up time with all of the layers of stuff that we had uh, to less than 42 seconds through modernization and through the strategy that we had. And that just from a number standpoint uh, returned uh, literally over 1500 hours a day in productivity to the department. A day. Uh, millions of dollars of, of lost productivity where people would be waiting to. So in terms of getting the support, uh, having those metrics and having that data and being able to go to my leadership and say, you, you won't have to hear people complaining about their IT anymore. Uh, that alone was one thing. And then two, the cost savings and the return on investment uh, is where we got the buy-in. So just getting people focused on the day-to-day -day and taking away some of the complexity of uh, the, the mundane. Yes. It's like you're added, you just added people, added full-time employees yeah. to the organization. So that, well, I think we, that's a great start, Jason. Thank you. I want to I turn to Mark and, um, you know, hear your story, Mark. How did you, uh, you know, begin this process of transitioning to remote work and not just remote work, you know, setting up an environment where where children can be educated in a remote way where necessary. We, um, you know, very similar. I listened to Jason speak, and it's like bringing back the pathway that I'm following as well. So there's there's a lot of similarities. I will say one of the one of the key things I found, and I've been at Dodi about two years. Um, as we did a lot of that same looking that many of us do when we were new to an organization. Uh, one of the, I, the areas I identified to look at was partnerships and begin to develop those partnerships with, with our different educational organizations out there, um, externally partnerships with many of the schools under the Department of the Education um, to understand how really to run IT, not coming from an educational background, how to run IT in an educational environment. So I, I had to learn very quickly because wasn't on board very long, and then here comes this thing called COVID. I call it BC. Before COVID, everything was running smooth. We were starting to rationalize our applications. We'd identified those, those different platforms that we were moving to. We'd put our foot in the door of cloud migration. Um, we already had a number of, uh, as Jason mentioned, cloud offerings already up and running out there, trying really to pull that together. And then right as we hit the middle of school, er, school year last year, around February, South Korea's school started closing. And then it became this ripple effect. The, the problem we found, that the challenge, it wasn't a problem, it was a challenge, is that we had to change from a on-prem teacher teaching environment to a fully remote environment and utilize the tools that we had. I'm an old army soldier, so I'm gonna use what I have right now. I know that I will get something in the future, but we have to use what we had. So we had to use those advancements that we made we had to use those partnerships, and we also had to use what I, I think a, a big push of innovation. So when we finally closed our final school, we had 8,500 teachers that weren't necessarily used to teaching in a remote environment. Now they're struggling, they're trying to learn, just like you mentioned, Jonathan, earlier, students are trying to learn, you know, how does a kindergartner or first grader now operate in an environment that they're not used to? They're used to watching cartoons. Now they have to watch their teacher and they have to learn that way. So there was a lot going on from that avenue. You know, we found that communication was very important. Collaboration was key to that. Um, we had some technical challenges with our VPN. Um, we had to do some workarounds. We operate our, our educational side in G Suites for Education. So we had to quickly expand that environment. We weren't necessarily prepared for where we were going. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely weren't prepared for um, Google Classroom and those other things that now were necessary for that teacher to learn. So we actually made that transition in about a four day period. We transitioned from brick and mortar learning for all our schools into the Google Classroom, the G Suites environment, tool sets, uh, enhanced security in about a four day period. Was it perfect? No. I think you always have that kid that's going to try to find ways around and try to uh, Google bomb his teacher. Um, we had that, but we found ways to prevent that and we kept working and working. So as we moved into this environment, I, I got to give credit to our teachers and teachers around the world. And I think Jason will probably echo that with me that are facing all these new challenges now, as well as the parents and the students, because it is a totally different learning environment. 
But from a technology perspective, we had already put a number of things in place that allowed that collaboration and communication. We were already using our platforms. That made change a lot easier. That mm -hmm. made communication a lot easier. That made automation a lot easier. Where in the past, we would have had to code a cold fusion application that would have taken weeks or multiple people. We could change code. We could modify workflows. We could make those changes very quickly in, in, in hours compared to weeks or, or months as it was previously. So I, we were prepared. That, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great point. You know, uh, this is not to say there's never a time to develop a custom application. But most of the time, the things we do are similar across organizations. It's about workflow to your point. It's about moving mm -hmm. data and uh, getting approvals and you know various kinds of uh, you know related activities. So if you have a platform for workflow and you can use it, uh, you're at the 50 yard line. You know, and you you can, you can sprint to the end zone perhaps. I, I think there was Mark. There was something in there that you you mentioned that I, want, I you know I had a reaction to. You talked about. Uh, you got the Google Classroom up and running. Technically, it worked, uh, but there's that whole change management piece, not just for the students to learn, but, uh, you know, I come from a family of teachers, and I was with my sister and our, my sister-in-law recently, and I'm hearing them, uh, a lot of anxiety around teaching uh, in this upcoming school year, and they will be remote in the beginning of the year. What, uh, you know, how did, they, how did teachers adjust culturally to uh, that kind of change? And, um, you know, was there a role for your organization in, su in supporting them through that? Oh, yes. And it, so it was a big change for many teachers. Um, you know, like I'm struggling with this, what we're doing here. I'd much rather be in person standing beside you and Jason talking. Same way with a teacher in, in many instances, the way they relate to the students. We saw such um, positive activity from many teachers who used YouTube um, and the kids, the kids, especially the high school students, they, they fell right into this. This was good for them. It was the younger kids that we had to really work with. So the teachers, the teachers had to learn how to teach differently. They had to learn how to teach remotely, um, as well as even our staff. You know, we were an organization in BC before COVID that didn't telework a lot. We did not have a lot of telework. So now all of a sudden, you've got 8,500 people trying to telework when they're not even used to how to connect to the VPN, how do I report a problem? What if I can't connect to the VPN? So there, there were a lot of changes in a very short period of time. Um, you know, that's where I think the collaboration and the change management came in. Um, communication was key. How do I log into the VPN? Um, what do I do? That constant communication helped that teacher, I believe, um, sort of get more comfortable with teaching in an environment that previously they weren't comfortable with. Um, yeah. Some, uh, some people will never get comfortable with this environment. It's just not, not, you know, doesn't bode well for some people, but these teachers, they, they overcame, I, I'll continue to give them props. Hopefully they're not watching this. They'll get big heads, but they did a great job in, in what they've done. Teachers around the world, you know, I can't say enough as to how they're doing it. So we went to the remote environment um, to expand on that a little bit more, we are now operating in three environments. We're operating in a brick and mortar environment. We're operating in a remote environment and we're also operating a virtual school. So in a pattern of seven months, we've went from one operating environment to now operating in three. So uh, congratulations. I mean, it shows what's possible, right? It's a great, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a great example. And if, Jason, let's just switch back to you for a second. Um, as we've been chatting, uh, you, sh you shared um, a story, which uh, hopefully you can you can share with us, the audience uh, now. Um, you had to make some quick innovations in terms of how um, you got people PIF cards and, and badges, and there's some complexity there. That wasn't something, uh, as I understand it, you were anticipating, and you had to react very quickly. Uh, now you have some new capabilities in your environment, it sounds like. So what can, would you please share that story with us? Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to, to add to uh, Mark's comment, though, because I absolutely agree the partnership and collaboration is key. Uh, and, and I know Fatara does a lot for that of making sure that the CXO communities work together. But the reality is, if you don't have those partnerships, uh, it, it's a much heavier lift and, and challenge. Uh, so uh, in terms of some of the, the challenges, yes, when we uh, I felt like uh, operationally, we were in a really good place. Uh, we, I mean, everything was new, everything was modern. Uh, we had communicated, uh, this is how you, uh, you know, the department had a, 
uh, while the amount of telework was less than where we're at uh, today, uh, everyone was used to teleworking and knew how to telework and knew how to connect to our VPN solution. So the, the lift wasn't uh, a lot of that, literally, and I, I know I had shared with you before, when the pandemic first hit, uh, our average speed to answer from a, a call standpoint went to, I think, around 55 seconds. And within two days, it was back down to 14 seconds. So everyone was used to the environment. But uh, one of the challenges that we were not anticipating uh, was when people can come in and get PIV cards. Uh, you know, the multi-factor authentication, uh, CAC if you're in DOD, uh, that you, you couldn't get them. Uh, so we went to uh, several of the vendors who are providing the services because uh, we're a contractor-owned, contractor-operated uh, IT organization. Uh, and it was, this is going to take several weeks uh, or months to actually engineer a solution. Uh, the bottom line is we knew that we had around two weeks because we were going to be having new employees come into the department and we needed to be able to provision them uh, equipment that could log in and authenticate to our environment. Uh, and very quickly the teams worked uh, and within five days, two of those days being over a weekend, uh, they came up with a, an approved solution that would allow us to provision equipment, uh, you know, send out equipment to people's homes. Uh, so it's, it's really changed the way uh, but to your point earlier, I think having a platform that could manage that was absolutely critical because when you have a bunch of requests coming in and if, if you didn't have a centralized uh, vehicle to manage all of that and know where your pain points were, that would have been a nightmare. Uh, mm -hmm. So in the end, the fact that we actually do have a solid platform that actually manages IT requests or service issues um, and provisioning equipment, whether it's credentialing or, or issuing equipment, uh, that enabled us to to make that a smooth transition uh, than if if we hadn't had that. So, uh, but that was just one of the challenges we faced. Um, well, now, now you have a new capability in your environment, right? And you can bring people uh, on board remotely, and you can provision them uh, remotely. Uh, so, some some CIOs that I that I've spoken with, where they've had these kinds of experiences, they um, they very you know, in, in the rush to get it done, they did it in a way that um, it works, but it might, it might not be sustainable, it might not be scalable, uh, they have to revisit. Jason, what did you do to make sure that as you implemented those changes very quickly, you, you did it so they become part of your readiness and your organization? So, you know, it's not, you know, it's not gonna break. You feel comfortable and confident in it and it's on to ongoing success. So that's a great question. I think collaboration is probably the key there is that we, uh, yes, we did it for education, but we also communicated across the CIO council what our approach was because we knew other agencies may have similar challenges. Uh, you know, we brought in DHS as well to talk about what we were doing. Uh, so it was really the collaboration of government that, it, at least in my mind, ensured that it was a scalable solution that was repeatable. Uh, and to your point from a uh, a new item in our tool chest, if you will. In the past, if we would have had a situation where uh, people could not uh, perhaps leverage a PIV card, uh, the answer would have been, well, you wait a couple of days and come into the office and we'll get mm -hmm. the fix for you. Uh, now we don't have to wait. Uh, we can do it right away. Uh, usually it's next day or faster. So it's, it has changed the way that we can, you know, the, the speed at which we can deliver service. But uh, the scalability that was literally through a partnership and collaboration. No, that's a great story. If you get people productive faster, they can do their jobs more more quickly. Uh, Mark, any any reaction or similar kind of story you'd like to like to share with the audience? I think you know um, what we built and what we had to innovate and those things we put in place. We were always thinking to the future, even though the future was unknown. We wanted them to be sustainable. Um, we have a very as being the Department of Defense have a, as Jason does as well, very robust cybersecurity requirement. Um, we did not want to do anything in, in our innovative ideas that would affect the data or affect access to the kids, those kind of things. So we always had to think that as part of our process. And we have a great cybersecurity group that came in, everybody back to that partnership, collaboration and communication. Any changes that we made moving forward, we wanted to make sure and align them with the, with the necessary regulation, assess the risk, but look at what we were doing for the future. It's like our Google environment. We could have built it up and we could have taken it down at the end of the year, thinking we're all going back into brick and mortar schools this year, but instead we built it up and sustained it. And it was very similar to a number of our applications. 
COVID reporting is not going away. So we have an application to where those things are reported and we're tracking and monitoring. That's not going away. That was a quick fix, but also may be there with us for a number of years. And, we, and also data retention too is very important. The collection of the data and the retaining of the data for lessons learned, as well as moving forward in the future. So we, we saw a lot of the same things probably Jason did, but always continued as, as many people do thinking to the future, what we build has to endure, it has to stay. It's either a foundation to build off on in the future, but you gotta put effort into that foundation. If you don't put the effort in the foundation, you'll never be able to build on it. So to begin with the future in mind. That's, what, that's what I, I just wrote down here. And it was challenging because even you don't know the future, you, you can anticipate. And that's a lot, I think, of what we do as CIOs anyway, knowing that the future's not known from a budgetary and a technology perspective, but you have to put that effort into saying, okay, this isn't probably gonna go away. We may be working differently for the next two to three years, build it so by year two, we can relook at it. So. Right, well, you know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's not a, overstatement to say that we live in a highly complex world. It's very interconnected. There are a lot of risks out there. And as we're um, thinking about running um, operations that support complex organizations, you need flexibility, you need adaptability, the interoperability we talked about. Those are all things you're, you're describing here. Integration of different technologies very quickly to, to maintain and achieve uh, you know, long-term business outcomes, mission outcomes. So um, good story so far. We're gonna, we're gonna pause for just a second and uh, we're gonna put up a poll to get uh, the, some audience input. So you're gonna see two questions up here now. Um, so the first is asking the audience, um, what the greatest challenges were as your agency moved into, uh, to become a digital organization? And then on a scale of one to five, how challenging was the transition to uh, remote work as you, um, you know, as we made these changes related to COVID? So please go ahead and uh, answer the poll and we'll share the results back. All right. So uh, as, as we move on, um, I wanna uh, pivot for just a second and um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the opportunities that come out of this kind of uh, situation. You know, we are, we're all very focused on, um, you know, I think, uh, I think about it as the inside, uh, you know, we have an inside out uh, approach sometimes to the way we serve our customers. We, we know what uh, we need as uh, the government officials or what our programs need. And, you know, we structure systems and approaches so we can get that. Um, but we don't always think first about how the um, customers uh, interact across systems or across the agencies. And if we are able to think strategically about the way we have our, um, we design our systems and we build, you know, we can meet customers where they are, I think, uh, much more, much more efficiently. So uh, thinking about that idea, um, working from the outside and working from what the, what the, your employees need or your students need, uh, what kind of opportunities emerge in this new, uh, in this new paradigm and the new normal and working remotely for an un, uh, unknown period of time? What can we do different and how can we really change the way our, our agencies work? Uh, start with Jason, any, any thoughts or comments we might be able to uh, build upon? Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a tricky question because there's a lot of different possible answers, but I think, um, and, and I think Mark hit on this before, I think communication is, is absolutely critical um, in terms of making sure that the people uh, are informed of not only the capabilities that you have and the capabilities that they have uh, available to them. Um, so when I think about the use of collaboration tools, uh, that has been, when, prior to COVID uh, or BC, uh, we had uh, around 60,000 uh, sessions a month with the department. Uh, and last week we hit over 400,000 sessions in a month. So I think from a, a collaboration tools and making sure that people understand how to use them and uh, just in terms of capability uh, outside in, I think that's, that is really critical. Because uh, it, it, it doesn't matter if you have a, a great set of services if people don't know they're available or don't know how to use them. 
uh, which goes to the second piece, which is education. Uh, not just communicating, but educating and making sure that people are aware uh, of, of uh, and then of course, uh, receiving feedback. Uh, we've got tons of feedback, uh, a lot of it extremely positive, but some of it as in, hey, uh, we didn't think of this problem. Uh, and what's fascinating now is because we have thousands of people who are now working remotely, uh, there's, there's other challenges that have come up that you know, we didn't think of. Uh, and, and I'll just, just kind of to, to give some context here, uh, I think one of the things that certainly um, maybe were in people's minds when we first transitioned from a COVID standpoint to where we're at now was how can we ensure that the people are, are working and producing? Uh, but what's been fascinating is to watch the, this, the flip of that where how can we make sure people are not working too much? Uh, and disconnecting uh, from work more uh, because sometimes people feel like they're now always connected. Uh, so those are just a couple. Well, thanks, Jason. I, I think the the idea of being uh, a digital organization is really built around that um, outside in approach because you're you've really changed the way you you um, go about uh, you know building systems and interacting with customers and employees. And you know, again, I wrote down collaboration and then. Um, education, making sure people know what's possible, to give them the, the ability to work how they how they want to. Uh, Mark, thinking about the people you support in the in the, the, the school children, the educators, um, what you know, what what sort of reaction do you have to that concept of you know digital and tied to uh, you know outside in uh, development uh, design, uh, user centered design? Maybe sometimes that's how we think about it. Uh, yeah, I think so. people support good outcomes. Sort of to go off of what Jason said as well, you know, our director made a good statement um, a, a few months ago about we went from working at home to living at work. And it really seems like that a lot of times the way we are now. But our users, you know, as we, you know, with all that we had going on, the new technologies that were, they were experiencing, what we were providing to them, um, it couldn't be with a lot of training. We had to use the KISS method. We had to keep it simple. Um, we had to roll it out and provide some training. It was a much different environment. Previously, we, we would have had lunch and learns. We would have did all these things to support a rollout. Um, the help desk tech used to be able to come to your desk and help you with your laptop. That doesn't happen anymore. That, you know, the ability to touch and show people things wasn't available. So back to that collaboration and communication um, how did we do desktop support change totally from that perspective if they were having a problem um, getting getting an understanding getting that the necessary training down to the user to be able to utilize whatever that application whatever that device was as quickly as possible so they could get it out and moving as well um, it was a great partnership with us with our education technologist mm -hmm. because they're a big part of the education environment as well and they're working on that technology that supports education. We're side by side with them working on, on the technology from an information perspective and there's a great partnership there. That was a big success for us because they're the ones who are, are more local to the teachers, help the teachers through the technology, everything from how do I work my interactive flat panel to how do I use Google Classroom? So there was a lot of partnership, um, working, training, in a, in a very short time frame. Looking back now, I don't know that we could have done it any differently, um, but I think as we're moving forward in the future, we are looking at different ways of developing training. We're rolling out different things. We've rolled out Microsoft Teams. We've got a much larger platform now than we had previously, um, which was coming. We expedited the rollout of that um, to help support the organization. Uh, that good, good, uh, good comments, Mark. I think that's a really, you know, uh, it's a really relevant example for what we're what we're talking about, and sets up. Uh, you know, you could you could apply um, that approach to a lot of um, challenges an organization has, whether it's rolling out new technology, support new program, pandemic, or just the the natural change management that occurs over time in in an organization. I think that's a really great muscle your organization has that you can flex for different different reasons. Um, we're going to put the uh, poll uh, results uh, back up for a second. From, uh, from the first poll. And uh, I thought it was interesting that um, the biggest challenge was uh, virtual capacities. 
uh, of, of everything we we put up there because you know a lot of it has to do with the collaboration tools the ability to to work under um you know in 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 new can in new ways using uh microsoft teams zoom uh, google meet all these different uh capabilities so that that was the biggest challenge for uh for a lot of people in in transition it sounds like and then um just i thought also you know interesting that a lot of organizations 38 percent according to this uh to to our respondents um only had you know and uh, it, it was either not challenging at all for eight percent or 38 percent said they only had a few challenges so that transition while it you know, may have been um, a little bit uh, unique within uh, different organizations. The investments that we've been making in IT modernization uh, over the past several years, you know, uh, I worked back when, when I was in the government just a few years ago, uh, as Qatar rolled out and IT modernization was, um, you know, really critical in, in the last administration, getting us started with cloud and, and, and moving forward. Those, those investments really paid off now. May not have seen, seen like it at the time, but they're, I think, core to the difference that you guys are describing. Having gotten started, Jason certainly spoke to that. And I think that the, um, you know, the respondents here are, are noting that their organizations didn't have tremendous challenges in moving. So I think it's a great sign and a great story for the federal IT community about what we can do if we invest wisely and in, in build our organizations well. And we're going to put up a, a second poll that we'll get, we'll get the answers back in a, in a few minutes. Um, You'll, you'll see that second poll in just a second. Uh, so here, you know, how, how confident are you in your agency's ability to uh, embrace digital transformation efforts during and then after the pandemic? And I think that after is an important part of that question. And then um, how do you think your agency responded to COVID? Uh, we'll get back to um, we'll get back to this uh, in, a, in a few minutes, but we do have a question um, that's come in for Jason. And I'd like to uh, see if we can go ahead and uh, address that. So, Jason uh, and Mark, feel free to comment this as well. Uh, Jason, can you share maybe one or two uh, trends that you're seeing in education uh, in the post-COVID era? And, um, you know, how does IT support uh, these changes going forward? Yeah, so I, I think... Uh, one is the, as I mentioned briefly before, the, the use of the collaboration tools that we have from a trend standpoint. Uh, I would also say uh, supply chain management has been a, a very fascinating experience because the, the just-in-time process that we historically had used uh, changed when suddenly everyone was having a challenge uh, getting equipment. Uh, and just the example I typically use is uh, for a while there, it was hard to go to the grocery store and even get toilet paper, um, let alone any sort of disinfectant or, or that sort of thing, which is still a challenge. So I think from a, from a trend standpoint, it certainly allowed us to kind of recalibrate, um, you know, from a supply chain standpoint of, you know, what, are, what is the right amount of uh, equipment and services to have? Uh, so I think that uh, another area, and I've really tried to focus on uh, four key areas, uh, which is uh, enhancing our processes or re-looking at our processes because of the pandemic, uh, looking at our policies. Are there policies that we need to change because of how we respond to the, the pandemic? Uh, what sorts of tools out there uh, are we using that have been uh, great? Uh, what other types of tools out there uh, are available that could perhaps consolidate or ease? Uh, and then again, how can we better uh, educate our team? And, and I, I completely agree with, uh, with Mark's comment about keeping it simple uh, because you don't have a lot of time. You gotta ramp up very quickly. And the, the great news about technology today is there's a lot of really simple, uh, pretty advanced solutions out there that and capabilities out there that that is is open for people that, that is, is open for people to use. You know, Jason, just a quick note, you, your supply chain comment is I think really on point. It wasn't it wasn't just uh, you know the toilet paper and, and things like that. When you think about the the public schools in the United States, they're um, they're a source for uh, many children to receive uh, you know healthy food. I worked at the USDA for a long time. I worked at the Food and Nutrition Service, an agency there, and the, the school lunch program, the school breakfast program. Those are critical programs for a lot of kids. And those schools close, um, making sure that there are uh, options for you know children to um, 
you know, to eat, uh, to get the food they, they deserve. Just as, just as challenging as what you're describing, but the supply chain is really broken down in, in a lot of ways. So um, being, uh, you know, thinking about how, uh, you know, goods and services, uh, data even, is able to move through the, the large ecosystem. I think that's a, sounds like that's a best practice to be prepared for the future, uh, certainly. Absolutely. And I think Mark hit on that when he was talking about as a CIO, you're, you're always trying to predict the future. Uh, supply chain was definitely an area that uh, fortunately things worked out well for us, but I think going forward, it, it definitely uh, gave us some, some good lessons learned on these are some other things we should be thinking. Of. Great. Uh, Mark, any, anything you want to add there? I do have a question that's just come in for you as well. Um, just real quick on the emerging technology, I think that's that's a struggle a lot in education um, because we we always struggle to find the right technology for the right grade um, for the right at least in the K through 12 environment for that student to have in their hand to be able to do what they need to do. Sometimes curriculum calls out a different piece of a different device than you have on hand back to that supply chain. How do I now get because someone in the curricular side ordered this new curriculum that needs 100, 100 uh, iPads, how do I get that quickly? So there's always a, a fine balance, I think, and emerging as we move forward as more of that merges and technology uh, sort of expands to cover multiple areas. I think it'll be much better for us in education. I just wanted to add to that, but I, I did owe everything Jason said. Yeah, before that, so. Oh, very good. Um, yep. Now, the, the question that came in for you, Mark, uh, I think ties uh, into your, your, your comment you just made. Uh, the question asks, um, how do you go about evaluating new technology to solve new and existing use cases? So that iPad example you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you need 100 iPads to be able to teach a class. Well, you haven't had iPads in this kind of environment before. Uh, how, how do you evaluate the, the tools that support, you know, that technology capability? So we just established, and it, this was in, in process before, but we've, we've emphasized it now, a uh, classroom technology um, group, basically, that works in conjunction with IT, um, ETs, teachers, educators, external people from the organization as well, where we collaborate and come together, look at the curriculum, look at the grade level. I mean, especially for us, so, you know, a kindergartner can't remember a 16 character password with uppercase, lowercase, you know, we've got to find different ways of providing um, access and capability to the, to the younger students, to the, to the SPED students. Um, there's a lot of variety. So we couldn't do that in IT. I mean, that's not us to decide that. So we're back to the partnership. We're pulling together a group that will stay together. They're not, this is not a one-time thing. This is a group that will stay together. We're calling them um, champions program. Um, so we have champions out in each school in each region that are part of this group that we're consistently um, or constantly really identifying new technologies moving forward um, that align with the curriculum, that align with, with emerging trends from the educational side of the house, um, as well as we have cybersecurity in there, we have uh, privacy personnel, everybody's a part of that group so we can, we can lay out a good future plan uh, we do an IT roadmap every year that informs the teachers and everyone of what's coming from a technology perspective. But it's that partnership. I mean, that, that group of teachers, industry experts, um, as well as LEAs and others out, outside the organization, we're searching, we're looking. We, we all believe we can work together to, to, to fix that problem. I mean, that sounds like a fantastic capability you've added into the organization, a, go, a governance process, a, uh, you know, a, a collaboration process that will serve you well to build that uh, readiness for what's gonna come in the future. If we're all thinking about uh, the fact that we're gonna have to make change over time and it's gonna evolve, uh, those changes tend to be better, uh, better accepted when they come from that kind of committee. I think it's a really smart move, Mark. Uh, I, I applaud your, uh, you know, the, the organization creating that kind of, uh, that kind of group. Um, we're going to put the results from the second poll back up. Uh, put 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 those results up in a second here. And you know, um, I, I really, uh, you know, I, I think it's amazing, and I think it's great that 80% of our respondents here are confident or moderately confident or you know add in the extremely confident at the top 95 percent that uh will um continue our digital transformations in our organizations i think 
you know, uh, you know, we, we're past the tipping point. COVID has sped up all of these kinds of changes and evolution, I think, across all industries. Value chains have been, you know, really broken and people have different expectations. And I think government really gets it. And the digital transformation that we've started is only going to accelerate. I think we see that uh, that here. And, you know, also very pleased to see that, uh, you know, 85% of our respondents were satisfied or, or very satisfied with how their agencies responded. Um, you know, as a, as, a, as a former Fed, I'm very proud to, uh, you know, to see that and understand, you know, recognize that the government's led the way in a lot of, uh, in, a, in a lot of sense around, uh, around COVID. Um, we have just, a, we have about 10 minutes left and we have uh, another question. I want to make sure that we get to some some lessons learned. And I'm gonna open this question up to Jason and Mark, I'd like you to comment on it too. Uh, how are you handling um, accessibility in uh, a virtual remote world? I think, you know, I take that to mean both, uh, you know, not everybody can access these technologies, but at the same time, what if people don't have access to internet or they don't have uh, the ability to uh, interact uh, in, in, the, in the way that um, others can? Yeah, so I'm, I, will, I would say much like we, we do normally, um, meaning that uh, if, a, if a user uh, has a requirement, uh, we have a request process that goes through, uh, we have an entire team that's uh, uh, dedicated to assistive technology to make sure that we can facilitate uh, any unique requirement uh, for employees. Uh, as I'd mentioned briefly earlier, we are a, a contractor owned, contractor operated, meaning I have a small, uh, around 100 federal employees and then the, the rest of the staff are supported by contractors. Uh, as an example, our help desk is in Louisiana. Uh, so uh, fortunately on the, the far north uh, west side of Louisiana right now, but um, so we're handling it just like we would uh, even during prior uh, to COVID. Um, just addressing, talking to the employees and getting them what they need to make sure they can do their work. Very good. Uh, Mark, accessibility. Uh, and I, I think when you're educating students, you have a lot of, you have a range of uh, ability. Um, how, how have you had to deal with this? So from an employee perspective, we, we were in the process of a life cycle program. So our employees were, were covered. We had challenges with those that had been authorized departure and were on leave without pay and needed to come back. So there were a number of challenges we had to work through. Really, our students were the main groups that we found that there was, there was uh, lack of devices at home, lack of internet. So we distributed about 7,700 um, laptops, Chromebooks to students around the world, and about 249 hotspots. Back to Jason's comment about supply and needing things. You know, we, we had that amount based on our ratio within the schools, and our high schools were one to one, uh, middle and elementary were a two to one ratio, which became problematic. Um, when you're not a lot of the, the schools out, you know, around our areas are a one to one ratio, we chose not to do that previously from a funding perspective and it, we're operating fine when we're at brick and mortar, but now when we move out, not every student, not every child has a computer at home. Uh, you have larger families with four or five children. You know, how does that work around, you know, virtual learning with one computer at the home and five kids got to get on there to do their lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so we were distributing laptops as quickly as we could signing those out um providing the support for those again if they got the laptop home and it didn't work it's back to the et or it to help support from that perspective so we understood that there was a a a, a general important need and still is even now we're actually seeing some numbers increase as we're working in the three environments just because tommy's in virtual school his sister's in brick and mortar there's a re two different requirements there in a single household that we have to meet at this point so that's very complex. And uh, Mark, there's one specific question for you about uh, asking what the response to Teams has been. Is Microsoft Teams something you rolled out as part of this? We are, we, we, we increased the rollout, you know, across the department, they've done some things as well, but ours is a, a our Microsoft for education is what we operate on. Um, and we rolled out Teams as part of this, as part of this. We had Google Meet, um, which the educators were using and teaching for the classroom. Our goal was to roll out teams in this long rollout period. We didn't have that. 
we had to roll it out in, a, in and are still rolling it out actually down to the regional level. But just getting it out there as quickly as possible gave an alternative. We were having uh, a lot of problems with our Skype link connection. Um, immediately when we all went remote and everybody now began to rely on that capability, it wouldn't hold it. Um, we didn't have that capability. So here we had to roll out Teams and expanded the use of, of Google Meet for us, but we wanted to focus Google Meet specifically on the education and initially Microsoft Teams just on the business side of the house or the administrative side of the house. Eventually we'll look at what's the product in the future, but right now we have failover. If one doesn't work, we jump to the other. So the failover was really important. That wasn't necessarily thought about, but now you've got your entire workforce working off of one thing, if there's no failover with that thing, now your entire workforce is down right. and your mission's dead. Right. And systems go down. We all know that having been in, been in IT. So um, we, had, we have just a few minutes left, and I want to I return to Jason to get some lessons learned and uh, some concluding thoughts. And then, Mark, I'll give you the, uh, you know, the last word on that. So I, I think I've covered uh, the majority of them. I, I will say that the, the absolute most important thing is that IT modernization is critical. Uh, the collaboration and partnership with uh, your leadership and your peers uh, to make sure that they understand the, the significance and, and the value add and the, or the ROI on what you're investing in so that you have buy-in uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, supply chain as well. Uh, I think the continuity and redundancy and it, in looking for single points of failure to make sure that you shore those up uh, I know when we first started this journey, uh, our VPN capability uh, was, was right at around uh, where the department, a little bit more than what the department needed uh, to have all employees working at the same exact time. Uh, and, and there wasn't a moment that uh, went by where I wasn't thinking, well, what happens if one of those devices fail? Uh, mm -hmm. Again, we had continuity and we, we had a, a, a process built in but it's the sort of thing where, where now any of the processes we have, uh, certainly as it relates to VPN, could fail or, or all but one could fail and we'd still be able to provide the services. So I, I think from a lessons learned standpoint uh, and then the, the communication about everything that's going on is absolutely critical so that because you, you have people not sure, you know, um, not just from a technology standpoint, but even from a, you know, what is the you know, how is the new normal going to be for the department? And I will say the Department uh, of Education has been great on this is our plan. This is what this means to you, uh, which we've also leveraged from an IT standpoint to talk about here's how we're providing support. This is what this means to you. Uh, so communicate uh, all, you know, it's been absolutely critical. Well, uh, thanks, Jason. Mark. I think, you know, um, you know, we, we started school the 24th. That was when our, our biggest opening was and, and operating in these three environments um, has, has been a challenge. Um, but day one of, six of school is successful. And I think it's taking for us, it's taking these lessons learned, um, looking, as Jason mentioned, to the future. And DOD has also given us guidance of what the future might look like. And beginning to look at the future and, and taking what we've done and beginning to work towards what will be the new normal um, AC after COVID. Um, because it is going to come. You know, we're, we're working towards that. But we always have to keep these lessons learned, I think. And, and the challenges that we faced and overcome um, will face more. But at least in the back of our minds as we're planning forward, we, we've gained knowledge. We've gained, and Jason mentioned about his VPN, Ours was the same way. You know, if we weren't in three time zones, we would have failed. But the fact that we were in three time zones, I could watch the numbers and I watched the numbers climbed up and get almost to the top of that VPN, you know, sweating to say, oh, no, who's going to be the first one to get kicked out? Hopefully not the director. And, um, you know, all of a sudden it would go back down as the time zone. So we barely made it. We've upgraded. We understand. I think most organizations are really looking at lessons learned and trying to improve and move forward and move into what this new new is going to be for us as, as IT professionals. Uh, more remote, more technology, more different devices, you know, a lot, you know, is, is going to be changing as we've all worked through this. Well, I mean, great, uh, great comments there. And I think the complexity only ratchets, it, ratchets up as we think about a safe return to the workplace, a safe return to the classroom, 
uh, in schools, not just, you know, um, in the in the DoD, but across the country, as we as we understand what that's going to look like, the uh, just the the process of understanding how to get people uh, and children physically distanced as appropriate, or understand the management of PPE, those are all on the horizon uh, for for you guys inside of your uh, your organizations and your customers. So, um, you know, it sounds to me like you have a great start. Um, to, to deal with that next set of challenges based on your investments in modernization and the success you've had so far. And I, I wrote down three words uh, that I think, you know, form the basis of, you know, some takeaways for everyone. Um, communication, collaboration, and education. And, you know, for doing those things in our organizations, irrespective of COVID or another crisis, we're going to have stronger, more uh, resilient organizations that are that are ready for anything that can be productive in a time of crisis that can be digitally uh, resilient. So, um, with that, I want to I want to conclude our our conversation today, um, and I want to invite everybody to join the next ATARC webinar um, next week on Thursday, September third. Uh, we're going to have another conversation um, where we're going to have some subject matter experts focus on the cultural shifts that are happening in the federal DevOps ecosystem as a result of COVID-19 and how agencies are continue, continuing to update their systems to, despite uh, workforce changes. So you can see the upcoming webinar here and I, I hope that you're, you're able to join. I wanna thank everybody again for uh, being here today. I especially wanna thank uh, Jason Gray, who is the CIO for the Department of Education and Mark Patterson, who is the CIO for the Defense Education Activity for their insightful comments. Uh, their willingness to share their successes and their challenges and provide everybody with some great opportunities for, for learning. So uh, that's all and hope to see you again next week. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.